Hi, Jose, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. Hello. Hi, Ryan, how are you doing? Doing okay. Good. It's an easy chapter today, so. Okay, so we have about four minutes. <clears throat> There are five of you here. <laughs> um, go ahead and check out the notes in the assignment today, okay? Okay, so check out Canvas, download the notes and the assignment. We'll start in a few minutes. Okay, so download your notes and your assignment. We'll start in a couple minutes, everyone. Thanks for joining. <clears throat> Hi, Alex, how are you? Yes, we do. We have a short meeting, I think. The assignments is pretty easy. So I'll get you through the assignment and then you can enjoy your night. Okay, so check out your assignment and your notes. We'll start in one minute. So next week is your spring break. There will be no class in session next week, just a reminder. Um, let me get into screen share here. So we are going to complete homework assignment. So if you get that done at the end of the week, you don't have to worry about completing it over the swing break. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm very ready for spring break. I'm going to work on a few classes for the data science certificate and wrapping up some of the extra project that I've been working on. And so that way it will be ready for submission to state. Um, we're teaming up with UC Berkeley on the data science project. Um, so I need to get that finished as well. So, okay, uh, this week we are going to go over input and output mainly on keyboard and monitor. So if you want to check out your notes and uh, your assignment from here, we still have one lab to do. We are going to do a multiplication lab um, where we improve from last week program and we are going to make it faster, more efficient. Okay, so I will walk you through the lab on Thursday. And then if you get everything finished, then you don't have to worry about completing your assignments in the spring break. If you have some outstanding work, um, I have finished my other classes grading. Um, I meant to work on yours this today, but we got grant meetings and things like that. However, tonight I'm gonna try to knock out some grading for your class. So hopefully by the end of the week, I'm sorry, yes. Um. For the homework too, would it be possible to have it due like uh, after spring break or is it going to be due? Um, originally, I had put it for the 18th, but I don't want you to have to think about that during the spring break. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think that we should wait until, because I can have it due when you come back but that way you still have to worry about it so if you finish it this week how about if i just let's see let me edit i'd it. rather keep it this week okay so if you wanted to turn it in early okay um then you're welcome to do that how about that um i'm gonna because i was gonna have it do before you start the spring break so if you want to turn it in this week, you're welcome to do that, okay? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I will, I will have it due the Tuesday when you come back, actually, the Thursday when you come back, okay? Nope, that is the spring break week. So how about the 18th before you come back? Would that be yeah, okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So that gives you time, but again, like I said, if you wanted to turn it in before the 11th, so you don't have to worry about it, you can do that, okay? That's not a problem. Um, but if you wanted to get your, give yourself a little bit of time because your spring break's gonna go from the 12th through the 18th, and then you're gonna resume class the following. And keep in mind that we are gonna talk about um, our project when we come back. And sorry about my dog. He's a little bit excited with Amazon people coming to drop out packages. So, um, and then what we'll do is we are going to work on a few more labs and then we'll spend some time working on our project in groups. Okay. All right. So let's talk about your notes and your assignment this week. So in this week, we are covering chapter eight and chapter eight mainly hits input and output and so this is an area that is very important because without input and output, we, we human cannot interface with the computer. So input and output is a component of von Neumann model. And it's a way for us to get the information, get the data into the computer so that it can be processed. And once it's processed, we want it to obtain the result to be able to see it or to be able to store it or to be able to print it, right? So the input can be a keyboard, right? Motion detector, network interface. There are a lot of different type of input. So for the final and the quiz, just make sure you know what an input device would be. And for LC3, we mainly have input as the keyboard, okay? Um, and that's when we work with the program and we mainly design the program to listen in for any kind of keyboard signal, 
right? Like how you would have in for the instruction or you would have get C to obtain the character. So it will wait for the keyboard signal. And once the keyboard signal is received, then it would know that the, that the data has been entered. So for the data rate for the keyboard, sorry, uh, we would see that the data rate is important for any type of input and output. So keyboard is 100 byte per second. That's your standard. And um, now for storage. So when the book was written, that was a long time ago, right? So if you're looking at storage, how this was written back then, it was very, very slow compared to what it is now. So if you're looking at external hard drive, right, depending on the interface. So when we're talking about interface, it's when how it's connected to your system. So external hard drive, often we would connect it via USB, and now we have USB 3 or USB 2. Um, and if you're looking at the network interface, like how you connect for our Zoom meeting today, you can be on wireless or you can be on the Ethernet, and it's much faster than how it was before. So definitely the information that's given to you in notes and the presentation is a little bit dated. OK, so if depending on your network connection, so it depends on your service. And for most part, our network connectivity, our storage are generally faster. OK, now in, input and output basics. So in in the when when it's listening for the signal and once it's received the signal, the, in, the data that is being entered into the computer needs to go somewhere, right? Before it gets to your general register and we are gonna operate it with opcodes and operands, right? So the device actually has their own registers and it's mapped to specific addresses. So that way it can store some of the input information and before it outputs, it can store some of that before it, it gets to the actual device. So what we have is we have a memory mapping process with input and output, and we have address that's allocated for input and output device. So with the, with the keyboard, right, it would have registers, not just one registers and memory location along with the monitor would have some form of registers and memory location. So in our assignment, the first question asks you, why is input output important in computing, right? It mainly allows humans to be interfacing with the system. <clears throat> now, some systems are autonom autonomous systems, right? You already start seeing some of that, but from a networking standpoint, um, when, when I deal with networks, there are a lot of autonomous systems. Many of the routers that are used to connect you to the web server, or the website that you're visiting, they're actually autonomous. Um, and so they don't necessarily would be, you know, need to have much interface. It's, they are designed to interface with other routers that are sending the data, <clears throat> that's forwarding the data, the neighbor routers. And then in industrial environment, we would see systems that don't necessarily interface with the human, right? It generally interface with other systems for things could be for manufacturing, for farming, et cetera, okay? So input and output allow us humans to interface with the computer. And it allows the user to enter the information so that way the information can be processed, okay? And output allows the user to obtain the result from the system after the information is processed and use the result. So if we're, if we're calculating, right? And if we, we're calculating something like, let's say tax, or we're calculating a problem, or 
we are trying to print out a form, we are outputting the result so that way we can use that result. So output is essential as well, right? So input allows us to enter the data into the system so it can be processed. Output allows the user to obtain the result from the system after it's processed and use the result. So we really designed the system for to help us, right? Technology is designed to help us with efficiently doing certain tasks. So for example, if you are a data clerk, back in the day, you have to manually calculate everything. Now you can use the system to do that and you would have to have some kind of input and output. So earlier we said that input and output devices have registers and we need to describe the purposes of the registers. So for number two, your input or output device would have two registers. One is gonna hold the data that's being transferred between the device and the processor. The second is that it's gonna use it to indicate the status information about that device. So what do I mean by status? Is it occupied? Is it busy? Is it ready to receive data, right? And I don't know if you're familiar, but with the interrupt process, right? So when the device needs the attention of the processor, it would raise its hand or a flag, right? It would generate a signal saying, hey, I need the attention. It's, so the analogy for this is kind of like, if you're in a classroom and you have a teacher and you have 30 students, and if the student needs help, the student would raise his hand or her hand or their hand. So in that sense, the device would need some form of register to maintain its status, right? Whether it needs attention, whether it's ready to transfer, whether it's ready to receive, and the other register, the first register, it's used to hold data. So when we're looking at get C, right? When we type in get C in our code, it's gonna wait for the program, the, the processor is gonna wait to receive the data from the keyboard, right? A character. And that character would then be translated to a numerical value. However, the, that character is considered data when it gets to the storage, right? Or being processed by the processor. So there so, are two registers, yes. So that status register that you use the analogy of raising your hand, that's basically when the user presses a key that's to let the processor know that the user pressed a key. Right, so it would generate a signal saying that it's getting ready to submit that key, right, that was pressed to the processor, right? So this is really to maintain the status of the device. Is it ready? Is it not ready? Is, has it received data, right? Because the data is, is stored in a register where that device is gonna maintain that data until it's transferred to the processor. So when you, when you have an interrupt, is when it tells the processor that, hey, I need your attention. I'm getting ready to give you some data, right? So when the user press the key on the keyboard, it updates that, that status register. And with that, there's communication process between one device and another. And this happens with all your peripheral device. Right, so when you're looking at hardware, um, I teach CIS 25 sometimes, and it mainly deals with like internal system component. And all of your device, right, and from the in the input, like the keyboard, in you know, along with the hard drive, everything, everything needs 
some way to notify the processor. Like if you're looking at hard drive, hard drive is an IO. It's a storage, but it's actually input and output, right? Because it writes data into it and we can pull data from it, right? Same thing with, with RAM, it's more of like an IO. So because it's classified under the storage, but when it's ready to store, right? It would also notify the processor that yes, it's ready to store. So when you download a file, right, all of this is happening in the back that the processor would tell the drive that yes, right, we are gonna process this data and it's gonna be stored. And the drive, when it's ready to store, it would communicate with the processor, it says I'm ready and this is, you know. And so when you have a full drive, let's say you have your maximum capacity is reached and you cannot save that particular file, what will happen is what it's gonna inform the processor would then on the software end, your operating system will tell you that you cannot store that file, right? Because it's, it's already, there's not enough storage. So you have to do something about that. So it lets the human control the, the, the management process. So operating system itself is just a way that we can manage resources for the system as we interface it, okay? But in the back, you also need ways to get things from one part of the computer to another and to, to let, to communicate across all the devices, okay? So that, that's important to understand because as you understand that, you would see how we would write applications and things to be able to, could be streamline the operations, it could be you know, for managing your devices, for backup, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So in your notes, it talks about how the status register would be, okay? So the CPU tells the device what to do, right? So that will be write to control register. And then the CPU would check whether the task is done. Excuse me, it would read the status register. So in, in the analogy of the classroom, the CPU is like the teacher, right? And all the devices are the student. So the CPU would ask the, the, the device, hey, are you ready, right? Are you ready to do a task? And if the device is ready, it's gonna say, yes, I am, give it to me, right? The same thing as if the teacher assigned the assignment to the, the student, are you ready to receive this assignment? And if the, the student respond yes, then the teacher would issue that assignment to the student. So it constantly would check to see if certain tasks is complete and it would tell the, the device on what to do, okay? On the modern operating system, you don't see this as much, but when you're looking at the older operating system, right, um, it, it would have an interrupt number, right, the IRQs, and then it would use that value to generate. So when the device needs the attention of the CPU, it would raise that value, okay? Now they, re, they removed the, the human interface behind it because we, back then we used to be able to set like a value for a certain device. But if you have a conflict, it creates a problem, right? It, it creates system halts and other things because the operating system, it detects that and it would, it would tell, you know, the, because you cannot have the same value for, for different devices. So, it would then need to have some form of control process and a status checking process, okay? So your control status register, it basically would check, is that task done? Okay, so when the user, like Brian said, when the user press the key and once that key is pressed, it updates that status, right? And then it transfer the value of the character that was pressed to the data register. Once that's completed, it's gonna update the status again. It says that's done, okay? Because otherwise, right, when we write that program, we see that we ask the user to enter a character 
after the user enter that character, it moves on to the next part of the program, right? We would do something with that character. We would store it, right? Or we would then output what they print, they, they typed in. So all of these things are happening very quickly in the back. So the CPU transfer data to and from the device, right? So it's gonna, con it's gonna check the status, right? If it's ready, then it's gonna take that data and it's gonna move it. So now um, when you're looking at electronics like a monitor, okay, or a drive or a keyboard, what you see is you, you see the actual operations that's happening and it requires these things, okay? Something for data and something for status. Okay. So in the programming interface, how are the device, how are device registers identified, okay? So we need to differentiate between memory mapping and special instructions. And how, so when, when you're looking at the device and how it's instructed to perform a certain task, okay? We already talked about the, the, the registers, how are they different? And so the data is really tied to the memory part of it right? And the status is tied to the instruction part of it. But for the timing and the transfer of manage, there got to be some kind of time window in that this is happening, right? It needs to update status within a certain amount of time. It needs to transfer data in a certain amount of time. When things, when the maximum time is reached, then it needs to really go back and generate something that you know, the device is not ready or it, it's not responding, right? And all electronics devices is like that. So when I explain this to my, my uh, class that I do with network programming with Python, you know, they see this all the time because sometimes when system's not ready, it's timeout and it's not gonna receive any data, right? So the switches and the routers and all the network appliances in between, they all have this type of functionality. They all have processors, they all have storage, and they communicate with each other in the same standardized format, okay? So, and that's through protocol and services and port numbers. So in, in an input and output event, it would then in general would be slower than your CPU cycle, okay? Now, when you're looking at asynchronous and synchronous devices, so asynchronous really means not together right, not the same. And synchronous mean together or the same. So IO devices usually operate at the speed that's different than your actual processor. It's usually slower, okay? So that is when we would see it as asynchronous. And the majority of the time you would see that almost all interaction would be asynchronous for IO, okay? So to really control this, you really have to have some form of protocol or a mechanism to really make it where it would, one would be able to communicate with another. And with that, your data is less predictable compared to something that's synchronized. So when it's synchronized, that will be together in, a, in the same frequency with the clock. So that way the data would not be missed, okay? So now if we go back and we're looking at our assignment, we, for question three, it asks you, how are the device registers identified? explain the type of identification. So it's either memory map IO or special instruction like what we said. So the memory map IO is the IO device registers, which are mapped 
to addresses, okay? And those addresses are allocated to IO device register rather than memory location. So these are addresses that would be tied to the registers and they're dedicated for those registers, unlike your other type of memory, okay? So when we say these registers, they work, they would work with directly with these set of addresses. So they would be protected from the rest, right? So that would be more, we, the user would not be able to interface or actually access this or even software, right? So on, on the programming side, what they do is they specify a group of addresses that will be specifically working with these registers. And we're gonna see that later on, okay, for input and output. And with asynchronous and synchronous, we said that most of our devices are asynchronous. So that means that it operates at a different speed than the processor. And for synchronous, that's generally used for data transfer, the IO devices operate at the same speed as the processor. So for things that it doesn't require synchronous, right, it would, it would be at a different speed. And then for things that require synchronous like data transfer, it would be at the same speed as the processor. So the data supply as a, at a fixed predictable rate, okay? So meaning that it's gonna always have that same rate because it needs to really sync with the speed of the processor. And so it would read and write at a specific or a number of cycle. Any question? And then we also touch on question five. It says, describe the types of IO control mechanism. How are they different or similar? So to control processing in an asynchronous world requires some protocol or handshake, right? Something that will be agreed, understood, managed, and handshake is just mean that it's gonna have some kind of formal exchange. Kind of like, you know, if you agree that you, you, I agree with you that I would give you a specific grade when you submit your assignment, right? We would have some, some kind of agreement in some form of exchange there. So it would have some form of exchange because it's asynchronous it needs to be set up with some form of process, right, in the communication. And when the data rate, rate is less predictable would be in, under the asynchronous. So the CPU must synchronize with the device so that it doesn't miss any data or write too quickly. So in the asynchronous process, what happens is it needs to really have some form of handshake, okay? But to really transfer the data effectively, it needs to synchronize so that way it doesn't miss any data. Any question? So you would see all different type of devices transfer data rate at all different speeds. So for example, right, um, let's say that if you're looking at solid state drive, okay? And in general, if we're just looking at a general, we don't have to look at specific, right? Let's say we just pull some information from Wikipedia, right? Sequential access, for this. So when you're looking at the rate, right, compared to what the book gave you, okay, so we're looking at between 200 
megabyte per second to 3,500 megabyte per second. And solid state drive transfer rate will be different than your hard disk drive, which is the one that spins, right, with the magnetic implementation, right? So your HDD is less, 200 megabit per, megabyte per second. So this is much faster than this, right? And then for the speed, it could, for the hard disk drive, it could go up to 480 megabyte per second. Now, this device would then be different than your network interface card or, you know, your video card or your keyboard and so on. Okay. So the processor would need to take a look at how the, the spec of these devices and how they're performing in order to make sure that the data gets to where it's supposed to be. Okay. Okay. So now <clears throat> when we look at the keyboard, the keyboard needs one bit status register. So it's using one bit and this is called a flag. Okay. So that flag is raised, right? When a, a character is typed, that flag does, it stops when that character, the data already been transferred. So that status is really important. It allows the device to signal or get the attention or receive the attention from the processor and it's using only one bit. For the monitor, it also used one bit status register. And this indicate whether or not most of the recent characters sent to the monitor has been displayed. So when you're doing, you know, when you're doing like in C++ program, when you're doing C in, right, that's really the keyboard. And then when you're doing C out, that will be the monitor, okay? So after it display all the string, let's say all the character in that string, then it needs to update that status register. That means it's already output that, okay? So that is essential. Otherwise it would not be able to work and display anything for us to see. Okay. And right below that talks about synchronous. So in a synchronous process, you would see that there's a single flag and it's called the ready bit. So this is used to synchronize the output, okay, for the characters that's typed at a certain speed, right? So with the input of the processor that can accept the characters at a certain rate, so you have a user that's typing at a certain speed, like let's say you type 54 words per minute, okay? And as you input that, it's gonna process it, those character at a different rate, okay? And each time that you type, for example, like your homework or your assignment, it's gonna then have the ready bit set. Each time the computer reads a character, it clears the ready bit. So as you type it, it sets the bit. And as that data is transferred, it, it read it, then it clears that bit, okay? So, and this is happening continuously and we do a lot of word processing, especially when we have online learning, right? So when, when we're looking at the ready bit, it's really, the ready bit is before it reads the character, okay? And then after it reads the character, it clears it. So that way it would get ready for the next character, okay? Now, if there's no character, if we don't type, then it's cleared, okay? And then since, because it's clear once that data has already been moved, then we would, 
we would it would then just wait. So when you type in something, it sets the bit, and then once it receives, it clears the bit and it waits for the next time you type. Okay, and that's what's happening. Okay, any question? Okay, so the CPU is really the controller. Okay, it, it goes through a process called polling. And polling happens with a lot of different devices, not just a processor. Okay, so polling is, it's really asking the devices, hey, do you need me? Do you need me? Right? What's happening? Do you need me? Right? And the device, when it needs the attention, it would generate what's called an interrupt, like what I said earlier, raising its hand, say, hey, I need your attention. And the CPU, when it pulls, it says, I'm here, do you need me? Okay. So that's how it's able to converse with the device or communicate. Okay. So the polling, in polling, what's happening is that it checks the status register. Okay. And then it's it's gonna check the status register, that ready bit that we talked about. So whether the data arrives or not, okay? So until the data arrives or the device is ready for the next data, and, and in, in the example, in the presentation, it's, it talks about how, you know, you have a bunch of kids in the car and they just say, hey, are we there yet? Are we there yet, right? So it's gonna keep checking for that data. And when that data comes, it clears the bit, right? So that's how it uses the status bit. In the interrupt, the device send that signal, okay, to the CPU when the data arrives. So it raises hand and says, I'm ready to send you data, right? And then once the CPU received the data, it clears the bit, okay? So in the next question, The next question talks about the type of register that you work with. And so for the keyboard, the memory that's, allo the location that's allocated, the address that's used for the keyboard is hex FE00, okay? That's for the status. And this is what we call the KBSR, Keyboard Status Register. And the other register is called the KBDR and D stands for data. And it uses hex FE02, okay? So FE00 for the status register, KBSR and hex FE02 for the data register. And they work together. Make sure we know this for final exam. Make sure we know what synchronous and asynchronous means. Okay. And you also see it on your quiz too. Any questions so far? Okay, so coming back to the notes now. So for your device, if you're looking at your word, right, this is because for LC3, we have, for, for the, the architecture we're working with, we have 16 bit, okay? And so it's dedicating the first four bit for IO. And then from for these bits, that's gonna be for the device. And then the opcode is in the back. So for the keyboard, it's gonna be at a specific memory location. That's the address that it's gonna specifically use. One for data and one for status. Okay, so when we look at that from the lens of, 
of LC3, right? When you move data, you're gonna do a load in the store, okay? To control the data transfer. And then basically you, you would then tie it to a specific address because when you load and store, you often load and store to a label which is tied to an address location, okay? The space, okay? So in the back, what we see is this is how they would program it, right? To for the data movement, that will be a load in a store. And as you load in the store, we would need to tell where that's loaded to from and then where that's storing to. Okay. So on page three, you would see a table and this is your memory mapping IO. So earlier we talked about the keyboard register and the keyboard register would entail the status register, which is your KBSR and then your data register, which is K, KBDR. So the, this register, it says that it's gonna be a bit Okay, you can remember we only need one bit and it's used to receive whether it tells the, the system whether it receives a new character or not. And then for the KBDR, also a bit, and that is what it's used to store the character that's typed. Okay. Now for the monitor, the monitor used the subsequent, right, memory location. So we have FE04 for the status for the display and FE06 for the day. Yeah, for the display, right? In, in LC3, what do you see? You, see, you look at the console, right? So using a software that allows you to see what's typed in, into that console. So it needs to have a status, which is going to be one bit. And it's going to be used to for whether to tell the processor whether it's ready to display a character on screen. Once that character is written for display, it's gonna clear that bit again, okay? So now going back to your assignment, it asks you to identify the location for display monitor registers. And we said it text FE04 for the, the DSR. And then hex FE06 for the DDR. And the DDR is for data. Any question? So make sure we know these for quiz and final. So how did they really work, right? We briefly explained that earlier. So for the keyboard register for number eight, your KBSR, it is one bit used for status flag it's bit number 15 and it's used to signal when the keyboard is received, is ready, right? It has received a new character. So it's used to signal when it has received a new character. The KBDR, okay, that will be eight bits from zero, seven to zero and it's used to contain the data or the input character. 
So this is why when you see in C++, you see char is a byte. And a byte is a character for is designated for a character, right? So when you when you use char, it automatically allocate eight bits to receive that, right? So the keyboard has the eight bits that's used for the data, then it's gonna take that, right? The processor is gonna then take that data and move it to the actual, you know, system storage, like your RAM or your drive. Okay, so all of this working together, we got one bit for status and eight bits for your character. Now on the display monitor, you would have one bit that is for your DSR and that's also bit 15. This is used to signal when the device is ready to display another character on screen. The DDR uses eight bits or one byte, and that would be bit seven to zero. This is used to write characters or your data for display. So when the user type in a letter, right, that letter is stored in eight bits at that register, then once the processor received that, then that will be put into the storage location, right? So when you type your name, when you ask the user to input their name, Right, you can, if you do get C, that's gonna be one character at a time. And each of those character uses the status bit and eight bits to transfer. It also used the eight bits with the monitor, right? So that way it can display what that user typed. Any question with eight or nine? Okay, no question. So now if we move a little down a little bit more, okay. So we already talked about synchronous. And so in the synchronous devices synchronize through status registers, okay and your processor would pull the device and the device can get the processor attention through interrupt. So here gives you the details on how, when the character is typed, okay? So in, for us, we are using ASCII Okay, so ASCII code, right, is used to convert so that way you can see text for humans. So that ASCII is the encoding system that we would use. So the, the data that's entered in those eight bits would be in the ASCII. So that's why when we write our program, we need to ASCII convert, right, to make it hexadecimal so we can then do something with that okay and then when we need to output we got to convert it back so that way the monitor can display the ASCII okay. so here it says your KBDR bits from 15 to 8 they're always going to be zero at bit 15 when it's set to one, right, the keyboard is disabled and the type character will be ignored, okay? So when it's ready, it would then set to one. When it's not ready, it would make it to zero, 
Okay, this right here. Okay, and your data is gonna go in the back right here. Okay, so this is two separate things. So it's using this in the front and then the data is back here. Okay, so on the KBDR, when the KBDR is red, then it's gonna set the bit 15 to zero. Okay, when it's not red and when it's ignored, it's gonna set it to one that will be disabled. And that's how it's able to tell just between one and zero. Um, this might be a bit off topic, but uh, how do uh, computers know if you're holding down a key on the keyboard like shift or control? So the control and the function keys have specific instructions, right? Instead of like your characters, like one, you know, numbers or letters, right? So the function keys is, it's not gonna listen for data. The function keys are used to design, uh, it's designed to control uh, the resources in your system. So for example, like if you're doing like a shift, right? That shift is to be used with other keys. So when they instruct that, what they do is they, the value of the shift is not, would not be in any of the data section of it, right? So it's gonna wait for another character key to really have that data, okay? So when they set up the key, if it's not like your character keys, which is your, your, your letters and your numbers and your symbols, Do I have internet? Generates the data and what? I'm sorry? No, you're back, you're back. It seems you lagged out. Oh, am I back now? So I was, I was kind of maybe get spotty internet. But yeah, so for your, your function key, like I said, it would not have the data. The data would come from your character keys your symbols, your number, your letters, etc. Is it still lagging? Let me see. I don't see any status with that now. Okay, it's okay now. Okay. But now, but it also have a status, a way to really check, right? Whether the shift key is pressed or not. So for these other keys, you have to hold them down together like control shift or function. So you have to maintain the pressure on that key. And as you do that, that status would, would switch. It's gonna say that key is pressed, but it's also gonna wait for other key to be accompanying with your, your function keys. Okay, I don't know if that makes sense because it's designed to work with an additional key. So, and that additional key would have some form of data or some form of instruction, right? Like, so if you wanted to make adjustment, like if you hold the function with like an F4 or something like that, right? So it's gonna, when you press down the function, it's gonna hold that, right? It, that, that, that pressure, it's gonna generate a signal, but it won't execute anything until a second key is pressed with it. Okay, so the processor is going to look for a signal from a second key when you're using a function key. Okay. Interesting, right? I love hardware. I think hardware is really cool because, you know, it really explains a lot of the logic behind this. So here is the implementation of your your keyboard, okay? So you have the address logic, okay? And that's gonna be for your allocation of 
of storage, the memory. Okay. So earlier, remember how we work with, we talked about gates, like a mux. So here, this is how it's going to receive with the gates. And then for your MDR, this is a separate gate. So for your MDR, this is where it's going to do the load. Okay. Because the MAR is really tied to the address. And so that's used for the data movement. So when it reads, right, it's going to tie, it's going to load the, the value for the address here. And then that's how it's able to point to the location where that's going to be stored. Okay. And then when it, when, when it writes and read, it's going to point back to this after it processed the address control logic here. Okay. So here it shows you how they design or implement, I should say, the registers for your keyboard. So when the input, when the character is input and print on screen, that way the user would see, right? And then that way that they would know that they can type the next character. So if I type in, just like how you type in your password, you're waiting for those dot, 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 or the asterisk to show up. If it doesn't show up, you already mean that it didn't register the key that you typed, okay? So the way that they write this in the assembly, it will be like this. They would have a label called poll, and it's gonna, it's gonna load register zero, right? To the KBSR. And that's basically a pointer here. They fill it with this location. And then it's gonna branch zero positive. So once it's loaded, if it's zero, right? It's gonna branch to again. If it's positive, it's gonna come back to load again. Okay, but if it's outside of that, when it's negative, then it's gonna go to the next one where it's gonna load, okay? And that's gonna be the data. So why do we say zero or positive? Remember how it talks about the signal with the zero, right? For enable and the, the one for the disable, right? So when it's doing this is when it's gonna keep generating the, the status, and if that status is generated, then it's gonna receive the data. That's the next part is when you're gonna load it, okay? And so in the poll two, this is where the data is gonna be processed. So once it's received that, then it's gonna store, and this keeps happening over and over again. So on the, on the LC3, for assembly, on the assembly level, this is how you would write for a keyboard. Okay. And here we mainly just use the general register and we tied it to the label, which is filled to the address of those registers. Any question? Okay, so the monitor is similar to that. Right, we talked about the address uh, for your display. And again, the data is the last seven bits here and the status or the ready bit is in the front. That's gonna be bit 15. So the DDR, the register, half of it, it's gonna be for data. And then the SR, the front bit is gonna be for status. And when the DSR is set to zero, right, the character from this is display. Any other character written, to, that will be ignored, okay? Now, when it sets to one, then it's gonna be not ready, okay? And we can do the same thing as we write the program for at assembly level for your display. We would have a poll 
and that's generating a loop, right? And then when it exits that loop, it's going to go in, it's going to put the data, and then it's going to come back to the poll again, and it's going to wait. Okay, and then we can fill them with the location. So everything that you see now on hardware, you can actually achieve that with assembly from screen to, you know, touch screen to et cetera. So on, on the, the ARM, like ARM64, when they write stuff for, for your smartphone and smart devices, right? It would use assembly language like ARM64 or, you know, a different version of ARM for most of your device, your smart devices. Okay, so let's work on the next one. So describe how CPU handles the priority of your IO. So earlier we talked about, um, let's go back and touch on the polling. So the CPU would keep checking the status register until the, the new data is arrived. You can take that as on page two. And that will be for number 10. And for the interrupt, you can find that also on page two. And the device would send a signal to the CPU when the data is arrived and or when it's ready for the next data. And so as far as today, we only talk about keyboard and monitor, but like I said, this can be, the concept will be carried out the same with you know, your drives, your other devices that's inside your system or attached or connected to your system. Okay. Um, so on the external device with the interrupt, it can, so in the external device, the external device can force the current program to stop, right? Um, have the processor satisfy the device needs and then resume the stop program if nothing happens. So what does that mean? When it generates an interrupt, it tells the processor to pay attention to it and do what it needs. It's kind of like what you said, raising your hand, right? Like if you ever go visit little kids in the classroom, they would raise their hand and say, can I go to the bathroom, right? And then the teacher would say, yes, you may. And then that would, that would satisfy that request. So when it, it generate an interrupt, it's requesting to some, some kind of pause, right? So it's just pause here and then it's gonna handle whatever that device is requiring and then it's gonna come back. Now, if you pay attention to malware, malware is really good at doing this. So the way that they instruct the malware is that it just takes up all the resources and require the processor attention, right? Isn't that true? So when people download malware, they download it and then their system just gets slower because it's occupying the resources. Number one, RAM, right? Uh, it's storing something there and it's gonna, utilize a system file for different type of tasks, depending on the malware. So if you're looking at like something like a key logger, um, a key logger is a Trojan in that it, it masks itself, it looks like something else, but its purpose is just to, to record every single key that the user type and store it and then send it out, okay? So in that, if you're looking at the assembly level, what's happening is that system is, it, when that when that program or that code is generated, right, 
it's waiting for what it's waiting for the input right as the every single character does input then it's going to generate it and it's going to send that, that out so it's interrupting your regular process in you know you can still do the things that you do you just don't have the the hundred percent resources that you would normally have and everything you type gets reported okay so your keyboard would listen and then every every character would be stored and when it it fulfill right like they would say okay store it with this amount of data and then be able to automatically submit it or send it to you know uh, a location or you know somebody that's receiving that a certain website or a, a server etc okay so Malware is notorious for hogging the resources. So it would generate the interrupt and it would cause that type of interrupt. So when they code that type of program, right, it would occupy it. And the processor is so busy satisfying the device need that sometimes it would not give back the resources for other things like operating system, you know, or when you're trying to use other application like browser, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now you kind of understand how that interrupt process will work. Um, and here, when you are implementing the polling and polling is gonna require a lot of cycle. I just touched on this this week with my networking class too, because, um, for a system like a router, which is, you know, it has a processor and RAM, like I said, it pulls every 30 seconds, right? It's gonna look for other routers out there. It's gonna say, hey, who's out there? Can you connect to me? And so when you have a processor that's polling constantly, it's gonna require energy and resources, okay? So it's gonna consume a lot of the resources. So now, with that, consider that when you're looking at what process that's needed for the input, do you require constant polling? And how, you know, in that case, how often? Okay, depending on the design and the type, of course. So to implement the interrupt, like I said, it's gonna signal the CPU and the CPU has to check that signal and then it would set the priority. So there's different priority in, in interrupt, right? It's like when, if you raise your hand first, you're gonna get satisfied. That's first come first serve, but not all system deals with it that way. So what happens is there's a priority value that's given to the interrupt. And when that value is evaluated, if it's high in priority, it's going to get addressed first. So even if it's interrupted later, so you might have a device that generate a later interrupt, but it's going to get addressed first. And then once it's fulfilled, that it's going to come back and address the other, you know, the the other ones that are asking. Okay. So, so uh, earlier when you were talking about malware and interrupts, uh, basically the reason why uh, a computer might freeze might be due to those interrupts going wrong. Is it's occupied responding to specific requests. And, and a lot of that has to do, so when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at like, so there's a vast amount of malware, right? So when you're looking at something that would uh, send out stuff to the internet that actually occupy two, a, a few device, right? Number one, your network interface card, and it's gonna have some, it needs to have some form of connection. So they would program it to directly connect to some kind of server, okay? And so the network interface card would then generate the interrupt and tell the processor that, you know, it needs attention and specific data but then the processor has to go and pull the data, whereas that could be from RAM, it could be from hard drive. And all of these things are happening constantly that it, it, it takes up the resources. And for software to be utilized, you have to have storage. Number one, your hard drive where it's installed, it's gonna pull the application from there. 
with your system path. Number two, it's going to have to to require some form of RAM. So if the RAM is being utilized for other type of resources, right, then it's going to have to wait and that processor has to fulfill the priority first and then coming back to your request. So it becomes laggy. Okay. So now, you know, and then you have rootkit and you have other areas of malware that, you know, so every malware has a specific behavior, but all malware is in some, some format utilized system resource. Okay. Um, like the, you know, um, if you're looking at ransomware, it just generate a, a, an encryption. So it's waiting for you to start the system. Once that, that is launched, it just encrypts. So it's instructing the processor to generate the encryption key. And then it's going to lock that key. They actually, you know, they can remotely do that or they can have you download something and it's going to run. Most of the time they, they, they have you download something and it would run for ransomware. So it would encrypt your drive and your processor is instructed to do that. And you can write it from a higher level. You don't have to write it from assembly, but you know, the, the more um, powerful, the more powerful um, uh, malware that you see like rootkit, it actually writes to RAM versus, you know, hard drive and, and other form of storage is sometimes, you know, it, and then sometimes it would write to the protected area of RAM, um, and that's harder to fix. Okay. So that, I'm sorry, I'm sidetracking with, <laughs> with malware. It's such an interesting topic, you know, like we can never learn enough about it because it's changing so fast. Like we, did you know that there's only 60% of malware that's known, that's known to your antivirus program? So don't you feel safe, right? <laughs> uh, people tell you to install security software in your computer, but that's only to detect the known malware or the known signature and behavior. The stuff in the wild, like it's more, it's about 50 to 60% that we, we never venture out. Right. Oh, it, it's not, um, you know, it really depends on the year. I read this year, it's about 60 to 50%. Usually it's about half. Um, and then, you know, some year we would have more. So it, it also depends on how fast and change of changing stuff. So the scripts that they're using now is so, so much more powerful and, um, you know. Hackers are smart. What? Oh, well, okay. So there are people who use it to attack. And then a lot of the times people use it to really circumvent your data, your system, right? Um, malware is really designed for monetary purposes. It's really to, to steal your information or lock down your information for ransom or, you know, one way or another. Um, and you know the the more bigger targets are are the the you know the server the system but through the user that's how it's going to be really um, impacting. So Eric says, depending on the script kitties uh, that have no due to what the hell, <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's true, but then where do they get the actual the the script from right so when you're looking at dark web how much so um you know the nsa and the dod they monitor some of that they really they really track like how much stuff is really flowing through and research company malware company they also track some of the things and so they would publish these article and they would say that you know like um so when i teach like classes like security classes i I talk about exploit kits and exploit kits are heavily tracked, um, you know, on, on, you know, how through the distribution channel. And a lot of this is coming from dark web. And then you got the script kitties that don't know, and then they would purchase or get free stuff and then use it. So yeah, there's some, there's some factor that will involve script kitties, but I also feel that like how, you know, ready, of these type of kits are available. And it comes from developers, 
right? It comes from developers and it comes from, you know, people that generate, create scripts and, and, and things like that. And yeah, I told my students in the past, you can't write in assembly and you can't write in C++ or Java or whatnot, right? Um, and, you know, even some of the virus, we don't know where that comes from. Some of the stuff that our government come across, we don't know where that comes from. We think that the signature is from a certain engineering company, but then it also shows that it's coming from, you know, other part of the world too. So, um, you know, and so if you understand, coming back to this, if you understand the implementation of how your hardware device communicate with your processor, right? Everything can be, everything can be written. Okay, so if you if you if you wanted to write it where it would occupy your keyboard and not allow the user to write anything in that form of malware, sure, you can definitely do that. You just have it wait, ignore the signal, and whatever they type, just ignore that signal. Okay. Um. So, makes me think about what really know too much about the ocean. Very cool, but terrifying. Yeah, I mean, the system is, you know, we instructed to do certain things and there are people instruct the system to do bad and there's certain people instruct the system to do good. So, you know, but without it, right, without all of these risks, that's what, this is what I tell my students, this, without all of these risks, there will not be a need for us, right? Not just the security people, but developers, the engineers, the scientists. Right, the educator, the students, there would not be a need for us if we create a perfect system, right? So if you think about, you know, they say that down the line, the, the, the system will be almost even more perfect than us. We're not a perfect being, but um, in that sense, really, you know, do we have a place, okay? Um, so uh, every year with malware, it's this uh, arms race between the people making it and uh, the people fighting it. Uh, perhaps, and the, you know, and then there's some propaganda about, they talk about the people who protecting your system are the, so, so the people who are hurting your system and that kind of come back to, you know, like you hear about anonymous, right? Um, people claim that anonymous, the large part of anonymous is their technical people, their scientists and engineers and developers and such. And that could be true. We don't know, right? Because it's such a large group and, and they're very secretive about their identity that we don't know. So would the question become, is it really, we're protecting the system, we're, protect, we're designing the security to protect against ourselves or really, um, are we looking at are we looking at job security down the line, um, or you know, um, do we strive for a better system overall, right? Uh, because there's no hundred percent protection, and there everything that we design has flaws. So, you know, so there's a lot of like really different interesting area that 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 we have to look at. Um, to when we think about design and system security and the implementation of security in, you know, in development, in networks, in users, in everything. So, okay. Um, something about proof of concept publishing their code on active exploits that don't have full patches. Well, you know, I don't think that we really close that gap ever. Um, you know, like when 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 we hurry up and release certain things like software, we still face zero day and then we patch the zero day issues or we fix the, the software that we release, um, then why are we keep fixing the same things over and over again or different areas of it? And if you are ever interested, like Microsoft is notorious for that, right? Like they always have CVEs, which address the security issues in different tools that they release. Is it because we hurry up and release the tools or is it because it's never aimed to design to be perfect in the first place? 
um, there, there's no such thing as perfect, but you know, um, and some of the things that will be working will not be perfect because in order to work, we have to leverage. So we have to compensate for certain things to be functioning by giving up other things. Um, and that seems to be, you know, the, the groundwork or the foundation of this particular field or industry. So, you know, and the, yeah, there are researchers that's gonna keep looking and keep patching all of these things, but then there will be new things that will come out that will have holes or the same thing that will have happen again, because otherwise, otherwise, you know, there would not be jobs for security people. There would not be hackers. There would not be computer science. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so okay so I think we are all that's covered we only have 10 questions today and it's mainly on um, your processor your keyboard your monitor your IOs um, take a look at your lab when you get a chance okay and then take a look at what you need to do. Go back and look at how you created the multiply program last week. Um, and then we'll talk about the lab on Thursday. Anything else, anything that you need, any question? All right, type your name in the chat. Have a wonderful evening. I'm gonna let you off early to enjoy this. So a little bit of light outside. So have a good night. I'll see you Thursday. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Carlos, any question? No?